All right. So, um, <laughs> oh, 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 my God. Day 96, 96, 96, 96, 96, 96, 96, my God. God, 96, five more days to go. Um, I have to be completely honest here. I do not want to be here reading this because uh, my copy of The Last of Us came in today and um, that leaves me like two days to play it t before I fly over to the States. No, one day, two days, two days, two more days, and then I have to fly over to the States and that's not fun. I want to play it. I want to play it, but no, I'm here. And I have a whole bunch of other recording I have to do as well. Uh, I don't want to do recording. I want to play The Last of Us. Anyway. Um, oh, hell, why don't we just, why don't we just read the, uh, the back cover blurb of The Last of Us. Actually, it's the, um, it's the uh, survival edition, which is a huge ass box. My God. Uh, I got the PlayStation 3 version because that's what I, that's, that's the thing I may, I mean as play. Wait, is The Last of Us available on PlayStation, PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 or just PlayStation 3? I don't even know. But anyway, uh, The Last of Us Survival Edition includes full-sized card cover art book by Dark Horse, $39.99 value. Steelbook edition of the game, The Last of Us American Dreams number one comic variant cover. Sight and Sounds DLC pack voucher for download. Naughty Dog sticker sheet. And the Sights and Sounds DLC pack contains official game soundtrack, PS3 dynamic theme, PSN avatars, Winter Joel and Ellie. And that's cool. It's really quite heavy too. I'm. A, it's. I think the weight is mostly the art book, which is quite hefty. And then after that, after that, there's nothing inside except for the um, the actual game itself and the steel book and a little DLC voucher. I got that version because I wasn't aware that uh, there was a better collector's edition available. But uh, by the time I found, it, I was like, oh nope, everything's been sold out. Oh well. Well, I'll still have my Bioshock Infinite Songbird Edition thing, which was huge. That box that came in the mail was wrong. It was... God. Nothing should be that huge. Nothing should be delivered that that's huge, unless I'm, you know, getting things in shipping containers and whatnot. Anyway, uh, that was a quick aside. Uh, now, back to... 100 Days of Narration, Day 96, Last 5 Days, uh, today's book, because it's Terry Pratchett Week, we're going to do another Terry Pratchett book, which is Making Money, which is the second book in the um, um, name of character, William the Word? No, he, he's, in the, he's in the truth. Uh, his previous book was um, Going Postal, Moist Lipvik. Moist Lipvik or Lipwick? Uh, I prefer Lipwick because it just, you know, makes him sound a little bit more German. Yes, no, yes, he's a German, that's a crazy German person, Eastern European, whatever. You know, most people can't really tell the difference. Um, I apologize for the background noise because my dad's watching television and, he's, and he likes the volume really, really loud, really, really loud. So I have to record while that's happening. And, uh, yeah, so I apologize for all that. But in any case, uh, let me read from the blurb. Ha <laughs> ha! I remember what it's called now. It's the blurb on the back of the book. It's, um, it's an offer you can't refuse. Who would not wish to be the man in charge of Ank Morpork's Royal Mint and the bank next door? It's a job for life. But as former conman Moist von Lipvik is learning, life is not necessarily for long. Life is not necessarily for long. The chief cashier is almost certainly a vampire. There's something nameless in the cellar, and the cellar itself is pretty nameless. And it turns out that the royal mint runs at a loss. A 300-year-old wizard is after his girlfriend. He's about to be exposed. The, uh, he's about to be exposed as a fraud, but the assassin. But the assassins' guild might get him first. In fact, a lot of people want him dead. Oh. And every day, he has to take the chairman for walkies. Everywhere he looks, he's making enemies. What he should be doing is... Making money! Title drop. Title drop. Drop of the title. Uh, name of book. Ha <laughs> ha! I saw what you did there. I saw what you did there, indeed. Anyway, let's have a, the whole, like, flippy pagey through the... Flippy through the pagey thingy, thingy that I'm doing right there. <clears throat> 
I think the printing is different because the pages are awfully light. They're much lighter than they used to be. Okay, uh, we'll start from here because it's an um, it's a page break and looks like the start of a new section. When he got back to the post office, Moist looked up at lavish at the lavish family. Sorry, let's start again. When he got back to the post office, Moist looked up the lavish family in whom's whom. They were indeed what was known as old money, which meant that it had been so long that the black deeds which had originally fulfilled which had originally filled the coffers were now historically irrelevant. Funny that. A brigand for a father was something you kept quiet quiet about. But a slave taking pirate for a great 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 grandfather was something to boast of over the port. Time turned the evil bastards into rogues, and rogue was a word with a twinkle in its eye, and nothing to be ashamed of. They'd been rich for centuries. The, cle the key players in the current crop of lavishes, apart from Topsy, were first her brother-in-law, Marco Lavish, and his wife, Capricia Lavish, daughter of a famous trust fund. They lived in Genoa, as far away from lavish... They lived in Genoa, as far away from other lavishes as possible, which was a very lavish thing to do. Then there were Topsy's stepchildren, the twins Cosmo and Pucci, who had, the story ran, been born with their little hands around each other's throats. Sorry. Been born with their little hands around one another's throats, like true lavishes. There were also plenty of cousins, aunts, and genetic hangers-on, all hangers-on, Hanger on, hanger ons? Genetic hangers on, all watching one another like cats. From what he'd heard, the family business was traditionally banking, but the recent generations, buoyed by a complex network of long term investments and ancient trust funds, had, di had diversified into disinheriting and suing one another, apparently with great enthusiasm and a commendable lack of mercy. He recalled pictures of them in the Times Society pages, getting in or out of sleek black cloak. Try that again. Getting in or out of sleek black coaches, and not smiling very much in case the money escaped. There was no mention of Topsy's side with family. There were turvies, certainly, not grand enough to be whom's. Topsy turvy. There was a musical sound. There was a music hall sound to it, and probably Moist could believe that. Moist's entree had been topped up in his absence. It was all unimportant stuff, and really didn't need anything from him. But it was the new-fangled carbon paper that was the problem. He got copies of everything, and they took up time. It wasn't that he was good. It wasn't that he wasn't good at delegating, he was extremely good at delegating, but the talent requires people on the other end of the chain to be good at being delegated onto. Sorry. Requires people on the other end of the chain to be good at being delegated onto. They weren't. Something about the post office discouraged original thinking. The letters went into slots. The letters, the letters went in slots, okay? There was no room for people who wanted to experiment with sticking them in, the, in their ear or up the chimney or down the privy. It'd do them good, too. He spotted the pink, flimsy clacks amongst the other stuff and tugged it out. It was from Spike. He read, Success. Returning day after tomorrow. All will be revealed. S. Moist. Put it down carefully. Obviously, she'd missed him terribly and was desperate to see him again, but she was stingy about spending Gollum Trust money. Also, she'd probably run out of cigarettes. Moist drummed his, Moist drummed his fingers on the desk. A year ago, he'd asked Adora Bell Deerhart to be his wife, and she'd explained that, in fact, he was going to be her husband. It was going to be... Well, it was going to be some time in the near future, when Mrs. Deerhart finally lost patience with her daughter's busy schedule and arranged the wedding herself. But he was a nearly married man, however you looked at it, and nearly married men didn't get mixed up with a lavish family. A nearly married man was stead a nearly married man was steadfast and dependable, and always ready to hand his near -ba Sorry, let's try it again. A nearly married man was steadfast and dependable, and always stead and always ready to hand his nearly wife an ashtray. Okay, 
He had to be there for his one-day children and make sure they slept in a well-ventilated... He had to be there for his one-day children and make sure they slept in a well-ventilated nursery. He smoothed out the message. And he would stop the night climbing, too. Was it grown-up? Was it sensible? Was he a tool of a veterinary? Was he a tool of a veterinary? No! But a memory stirred. Moist got up and went over to his filing cabinet, which he normally, uh, which he normally avoided at all costs. Under stamps, he found the little report he'd had two months ago from Stanley Howler, the head of stamps. It noted in passing the continued high sales of one- and two-dollar stamps, which was higher than even Stanley had expected. Maybe stamp money was more prevalent than he'd thought. After all, the government backed it, right? It was even easy to carry. He'd have to check on he'd have to check on exactly how much they there was a dainty knock on the door. And Gladys and Gladys entered. She bore with extreme care a plate of ham sandwiches made very, very thin, the way only Gladys could make them, which was to put one which was to put one ham between two loaves and bring her shovel... Sorry, let's try that again. There was a dainty knock on the door, and Gladys entered. She bore with extreme care a plate of ham sandwiches, made very, very thin, the only way... La the only... Sorry, the way only Gladys could make them, which was to put one ham between two loaves and bring her shovel-sized hand on it very hard. I anticipated that you would have had no lunch, Postmaster, she rumbled. Thank you, Gladys, said Moist, mentally shaking himself. And Lord Vetinari is downstairs, Gladys went on. He says there is no lunch. No lunch? There is no rush. Uh, I'm missing up the word lunch and runch. Am I hungry? No, I just had a really big dinner. Hmm. Okay, that's weird. The sandwich stopped an inch from Moise's lips. He's in the building? Yes, Mr. Lipvick. Wandering around by himself, said Moist, horror mounting. Currently, he is in the blind letter office, Mr. Lipvick. And there's a little footnote for blind letter office. <clears throat> and the footnote reads, An invention of which Moist was very proud. The people of Ankmore Pork took a straightforward approach to letter writing, which could be summarized as, If I know what I mean, so should you. As a result, the post office was used to envelopes addressed to My brother John Tall by the Bridge, or Mrs. Smith what does Dolly Sisters. The keen and somewhat Worrying intellects employed in the blind letter office enjoyed the challenge, and during their tea breaks, they played chess in their heads. That sounds like a wonderful job. Scary, but wonderful. Currently, he's in the blind letters office, Mr. Lipvig. What's he doing there? Reading the letters, Mr. Lipvig. No rush, thought Moist grimly. Oh, yes. Well, I'm going to finish my sandwiches that the nice Lady Gollum has made for me. Thank you, Gat. Thank you, Gladys, he said. When she had gone, Moist took a pair of tweezers out of his desk drawer, opened the sandwich, and began to disembowel it of the bone fragments caused by Gladys's drop hammer technique. It was a little over three minutes later when the golem reappeared and stood patiently in front of the desk. Yes, Gladys, said Moist. His lordship desired me to inform you that there is still no rush. Moist ran downstairs, and Lord Vetinari was indeed sitting in the blind letter office, with his, with his boots on a desk, a sheaf of letters in one hand, and a smile on one, a sheaf of letters in his hand, and a smile on his face. Ah, Lipvig, he said, waving the grubby envelopes. Wonderful stuff, better than the crossword. I like this one. Does buns hops it farmers? I've put the correct address underneath. He passed the letter over to Moist. He had written, K. Whistler, Baker, 3 Pigsty Hill. There are three bakeries in the city that could be said... 
There are three bakeries in the city that could be said to be opposite a pharmacy, said Vetinari, but Whistler does those rather good curly buns that regrettably look as though a dog has just done business on your plate and somehow managed to add a blob of icing. Well done, sir, said Moise weakly. At the other end of the at the other end of the room, Frank and Dave, who spent their time deciphering the illegible, misspelled, misdirected, or simply insane mail that sleeted through the blind letter office every day, were watching Vetinari in shock and awe. In the corner, Drumnot appeared to be brewing tea. I think it is a matter of getting into the mind of the writer, Vetinari went on, looking at a letter covered with grubby. Looking at a letter covered with grubby fingerprints and what, look, and what looked like the remains of someone's breakfast, he added, "In some cases, I imagine there's a lot of room." Frank and Dave managed to sort out five out of every six," said Moist. "They are veritable magicians," said Vetinari. He turned to the men, who smiled nervously and backed away, leaving the smiles hanging awkwardly in the air as protection. He added, but I think it is time for their tea break. The, the two looked at Drumnot, who was pouring tea into two cups. Somewhere else? Vetinari suggested. No express delivery had moved. No express delivery had ever moved faster than Frank and Dave. When the door had shut behind them, Vetinari went on. You have looked around the bank. Your conclusions? I think I'd rather stick my thumb in a mincing machine than get involved the f I think I'd rather stick my thumb in a mincing machine than get involved than get involved with the lavish family said moist oh I could probably do things with it and the mint needs a good shaking but the bank needs to be run by someone who understands banks people who understand banks got it into the pr People who understand banks got into the position it is in now, said Vetinari, and I did not become ruler of Ankh-Morpork Pork by understanding the city. Like banking, the city is depressingly easy to understand. I've remained ruler by getting the city to understand me. I understood you, sir, when you said something about angels, remember? Well, it worked. I am a reformed character, and I will act like one. Even as far as the goldish chain, said Vetinari, as Drumnot handed him a cup of tea. Damn right! Mrs. Lavish was very impressed with you. She said I was an out-and-out -out crook! High praise indeed, coming from Topsy, said Vetinari. He sighed. Well, I can't force such a reformed person as you to... He paused, as Drumnot leaned down to whisper in his ear. And then continued, Well, clearly I can force you, but on this occasion I don't think I will. Drumnot, take this down, please. I, Moist von Lipfick, wish to make it clear that I have no desire or intention to run or be involved in the running of any bank in Ankh-Morpork, preferring instead to devote my energies to the further improvement of the post office and the Clax system. Leave a space for Mr. Lipfick's Sinek. Leave a space for Mr. Lipvik's uh, signature. Yes, leave a space for Mr. Lipvik's signature and the date, and then look. Why is this necessary? Moist began. Continue. I have luck, Vetinari, etc. Confirm that I have indeed discussed the future of the Ankh-Morpork Pork Banking System with Mr. Lipvik, and fully accept his express wish to continue his fine work at the post office, freely and without hindrance or. Penalty. Space for signature, etc. Thank you, Drumnot. What is all that about? said Moist, bewildered. The time seems to think I intend to nationalize. Sorry, let's try that again. The Times seems to think I intend to nationalize the Royal Bank, said Vetinari. Nationalize? said Moist. Steal, Vetinari translated. I don't know how these rumors get. I don't know how these rumors get about. I suppose even tyrants have enemies, said Moist. Well put, as usual, Mr. Lipvik.
said Vetinari, giving him a sharp look. Give him the memorandum to sign, Drumnut. Drumnut did so, taking care to retrieve the pencil afterwards with a rather smug look. Then Vetinari stood up and brushed off his robe. I well recall our interesting conversation about angels, Mr. Lipvik, and I recall telling you that you only get one, he said a little stiffly. Do bear that in mind. Uh, I think I'll keep reading. Um, this, this, this. A bit more, bit more. It's also, it's a, it's also a short passage. <clears throat> It would appear that the leopard does change its spots, sir. Uh, no, let's try it again. Wrong thing. It would appear that the leopard does change his shorts, sir, mused Drumnot, as the evening mist drifted, waist high along the street. It would appear so indeed, but Moist von Lipvik is a man of appearances. I'm sure he believe I'm sure he believes everything he said, but one must look beyond the surface to the Lipvik beneath. An honest soul with a fine criminal mind. You have said something similar before, sir, said the secretary, holding open the coach door. But it seems that honesty has got the best but it seems that honesty has got the better of him. Vetinari paused with his foot on the step. Indeed, but I take some heart, drum not, from the fact that once again he has stolen your pencil. In fact, he has not, sir, because I was most careful to put it in my pocket, said Drumnot, in some triumph. Yes, said Vetinari happily, sinking into the creaking leather as Drumnot started to pat himself down with increasing desperation. I know. Oh, that, 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 uh, Moist von Lipvik, oh, you, you cat, you. Okay, so, um, hmm, right. Uh. Burp. Again. Uh, that was Making Money by Turn Pratchett. Day 96 of the 100 Days of Narration. Um, yeah, there it is. The nature of the narration. Last five days, we are on the countdown. Five. So that's five. Tomorrow, four, three, two, one, whatever. So, yeah. God. Uh, after this, two more Terry Pratchett books, and then we're into the last three books, and I'll just, um, I'll pick, hmm. I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll think of something for the last three books. I think they have to be something special. Or at least maybe special to me, but, you know, what have you. Anyway, uh, see you all tomorrow for another... No, wait, no, it's not the last three... No, wait, no, 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 what am I saying? Tomorrow is the last Terry Pratchett book. After that is... Um, one more book, and I'll be recording that on the night before, so when that recording comes out, I'll actually be physically on a plane over to the United States, I think. Yes, no. Yeah, something like that, anyway. And, uh, yeah, I'll try recording on the plane, and... Oh, my God. Oh, jeez. It's all, co it's all coming to a head. It's all coming to a head. All coming to an end. 100 days. Almost up. Yep. See you, see you for that. Hey, you seem like a cool, wonderful, and or awesome individual with impeccable taste in voice actors. So why not follow me on Facebook or Twitter? You can keep up with the latest projects I'm in, or that my friends are in, or that you could be in because I occasionally post links to open editions to various projects that require voice acting out there, or that nobody's in, but they're interesting projects nonetheless that you may also find interesting. Also, lots of random thoughts about whatever's on my mind at that particular moment. Usually it's about food or video games or foodie video games. Mm. Anyway, you can follow me on Facebook at OmadonVA or Twitter at Omadon. Hope to see you there.